Welcome to South Asia Chat, a podcast brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. I'm your host, Rajni Gamage, a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute. Sri Lanka's foreign relations are influenced significantly by attempts to recover from the national economic crisis in 2022. The country's inflation has fallen to single digits after two years, one of the world's highest a year ago. In March 2023, Sri Lanka secured a US dollars 2.9 billion international monetary fund extended fund facility arrangement. However, its economic situation remains precarious, with the foreign reserve of US dollars 3.6 billion reported in August this year and with foreign debt restructuring still in progress. To understand Sri Lanka's foreign relations against national, regional and international developments, I'm joined by former Ambassador Mr. ALA Aziz, former permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in Geneva and Vienna. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Aziz. Thank you, and um, I am very happy that I am on this program. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. So to get the conversation started, um, let me ask you the question on what your opinion is on Sri Lanka's current trajectory of foreign relations. Uh, do you detect some distinct principles that guide Sri Lanka's current foreign policy, and what may some of these be? No, well, uh, the, the issue is, uh, the question is uh, the difference between past and present. And, uh, of course, you know, the history was so fluid, you know. Uh, so, therefore, I think there are several past and several present. But, of course, let us take uh, the period uh, preceding July 22 as past. This is uh, the people struggle period or Aragale period. And the present, of course, uh, after July 2022 till today. So we may call it post aragale period, but many people may not like, uh, you know, you know, uh, calling it so. Aragalaya, of course, emerged as a result of economic crisis, so which led to a humanitarian crisis. But of course, what caused this crisis? Crisis, uh, bad, bad decision making, wrong policies, and mismanagement of economy, as we all know. Right. Importantly, also Rajni, there was an isolation of the country in the international arena with limited external interactions. It grew slowly, but then, of course, you know, it happened really, right? Um, we may call it international isolation for the sake of discussion, but it is more of a case of the country isolating itself. In my view, it is a political and diplomatic failure in addition to economic uh, failure. So therefore, in short, uh, before before the economic bankruptcy started, now there was a foreign policy bankruptcy or foreign relations bankruptcy, I should say. So then, but of course, COVID-19 and COVID-related uh, politics increased the isolation. Of course, that divided communities also. And to explain uh, the situation, uh, you know, people were liberally using all kinds of concepts. Uh, you know, some of the con con concepts uh, that were deployed as a way of face-saving, neutrality, non-alignment, leveraging, hedging, balancing, bandwagoning. bandwagoning. Uh, these were all impressed on the people. Uh, to impress on the people and uh, also others that the government is doing the right thing, uh, but it drew a blank. So, as we could see, much of it did not have any content or substance, uh, rather rhetoric. Now, coming to the present, uh, Rajani, uh, uh, mm -hmm. a new president and a new dispensation uh, have come to power in July last year. And... Uh, there are immediate challenges, of course, um, was to have the immediate humanitarian needs attended to, while, of course, uh, trying to restore law and order as well. So anyway, there was a legitimacy overhang, how to win public confidence, to reach out to the world for help at the same time. That was the, that remained as the major challenge. Of course, you know, nobody was talking, especially the political leadership was not talking about it openly, but that was the underlying fact. So if international isolation was partly responsible for the crisis that followed at the beginning of 2022, I'm not belittling, uh, you know, by saying the important other important factors, uh, you know, by saying that international isolation. 
breaking out of that isolation was felt necessary after July 2022, uh, you know, to, to reach out to the world for immediate humanitarian other needs and other needs. So the impulse was such that impulse ball was that such international outreach would effectively whittle away legitimacy challenge as well. So in the meantime, there was a concern entertained by a section of the international community, which included India too, uh, in particular India. Sri Lanka cannot be a failed stage, state and that all possible assistance should be given to Sri Lanka to prevent such a scenario. So this, of course, uh, is the context. So the Sri Lanka's foreign relations trajectory today, in my view, should be, uh, we, uh, we, we, we'd be assessed or seen against this particular backdrop. So it manifests in two different ways. The first point is Sri Lanka's international interactions have increased out of necessity. So the principle of necessity apply here on the part of the government and as well as uh, due to realization by other external actors that they should also assist Sri Lanka in this hour of despair. Negotiations, uh, uh, you know, continued uh, with uh, international financial in institutions uh, adding some weight to this approach. The second point that I would like to make, uh, you know, Rajini is uh, while international interactions have increased, how much they are transforming into uh, themselves into improved relations on a wider scale that is needed to lift Sri Lanka out of the morass it has fallen into, of course, remains to be seen. I think uh, the coming day and also especially in the lead up to any general elections in Sri Lanka would reveal that one in my in my view. So what is clearly seen uh, is uh, there is much less emphasis on certain concepts which were over relied on or used as rhetoric by the previous government, uh, which form part of the foreign policy of Sri Lanka before July 2022. However, we also observe that in some sections of the government, the propensity of resorting to some such concepts and principles is still prevail. And um, also, unfortunately, as a German philosopher once said, I should recall this one because he said that the past is still present in some areas of governance uh, because I feel there are continuing temptations there for using uh, some of the anti-democratic and rights restriction measures like in the past. So overall, uh, there are uh, international inter in interactions which have expanded and uh, some relations have been strengthened. Uh, Sri Lanka is a little more open than it used to be. And uh, but then, you know, so many other principles, they have not been discarded, but they, they are not being actively used in my view. So these are the distinct principles now seems to be a necessity and uh, like minded, like minded means uh, cooperation. And uh, working, uh, you know, uh, you know, working with uh, partners uh, uh, in a more friendly way, uh, yes. you know, manifesting no enmity. Uh, that that seems to be the principles now which are at play. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Asi. So I thought um, it was very interesting because you took us some key ideas there, starting from uh, the fact that prior to Sri Lanka declaring economic bankruptcy. That it was right. actually facing a condition of foreign policy bankruptcy, uh, and also highlighting uh, the yeah. audience to the fact that um, Sri Lanka's current engagement with its international partners is largely driven by necessity of trying to manage um, the situation out of the economic crisis as we face it. Um, and I think you also raised a few other very interesting points there. I'll just first start off um, as a follow-up question on that which yeah. is that you mentioned that um, the current government out of necessity uh, yeah. has has been more open and engaging with international partners. So what would you identify as Sri Lanka's approach towards multilateralism and regional engagement? I'm saying this as we observe the current government being more active in forums such as the yeah. Indian Ocean Rim Association. We also saw the president recently uh, and in other instances making uh, strong statements on climate change at uh, beyond the national level. So I was keen to we were keen to find out uh, what Sri Lanka's approach towards uh, multilateralism and regional engagement are, and what potential avenues 
Uh, right. Do you observe Sri Lanka uh, following to assume a more active re- player, to assume a more active role uh, in the region and even global order? No, well, I think Sri Lanka has a serious uh, capacity constraint in my view when it comes to uh, you know um, negotiating skills and uh, diplomatic skills. We have got fine diplomats. Uh, but however, over a period of time, I think their standards have fallen. So therefore, it's a kind of a responsibility the government of Sri Lanka and the international community also invest in uh, Sri Lanka's diplomacy to get the best return of diplomacy uh, to the world and the region at large. So it's a kind of a very controversial observation, but it has to be made, right? But as far as uh, Sri Lanka's multilateralism and regional engagement is concerned, of course, uh, they have has always been in Sri Lanka's foreign policy and foreign relations. A streak of multilateralism always been uh, they have there has always been there. So it has been there since Sri Lanka became a member of the UN and even before or, or even simultaneously starting with the Bandung Conference and uh, Commonwealth membership and also later SARC, IORA, Beamstack, and many others really, right? So what is happening now? Uh, what is happening before that? The, and multilateralism has remained an important feature of Sri Lanka's foreign policy, which I said. But however, it is a mix of regional and international forms of multilateralism. So we play a very active role. We used to play a very active role in regional organizations like SARC and BIMSTEC at once. And uh, simultaneously, we also played in, in certain areas uh, of, of multilateral engagement particularly peacekeeping, uh, law of the sea, uh, internet security, and then development, uh, especially international security. We were leading uh, in the in the counterterrorism, uh, you know, discourses really, right? So Sri Lanka has manifested its commitment to and oh, participated at the same time giving leadership as well, uh, not necessarily uh, just uh, multilateral processes, but also the outcomes and mechanisms. So staying in, participating rather than contributing, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, contributing uh, for a formality sake, I think staying in, participating, outcome follow up, everything has been Sri Lanka's tested and proven foreign policy traits in the past. I think I'm talking about past, uh, you know, uh, not uh, 2019. Uh, 2020, 21, or even 22, right? It's before, long before. Particularly, uh, you know, uh, the the period, uh, you know, immediately after we became non-aligned member of non-aligned movement. And um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, peace and mediation missions of the UN. I think uh, Sri Lanka has participated. Peace speaking operation is still disarmament for even even now i think uh, we have seen uh, ratification or ratification of two important agreements recently uh, the the total prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, treaty and the comprehensive uh, test ban uh, nuclear um, t- test ban treaty really right so so much more we have contributed now it seems to be actually extending to other forum uh, that is also because of the realization uh, that we need to reach out and we need to uh, you know establish uh, uh, establish constituencies abroad uh, which would be supportive of sri lanka at the same time also and uh, improving our our uh, engagements uh, with those organizations so that you know mutually beneficial uh, outcomes and relationship can be established there so uh, and and Sri Lanka has always uh, played a, a, a critical role in some of the uh, many complex negotiations, and it has helped to build a consensus on apparently intractable issues, uh, like you know law of the sea and uh, disarmament. At some point, 1995, NP, NPT review and uh, extension conference uh, chaired by uh, you know uh, Ambassador Yanda Danabala assisted by some able foreign service officers and uh, others. Actually, it was a t- turning point, turning point. But the world did not live up to the promise it made, including including uh, uh, yeah, kind of a, a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. Uh, that, of course, is a failure on the part of uh, major players, I should say. So Sri Lanka has done its job. So 
most importantly uh, within the region and particularly in the international context uh, of course in the development of international law uh, the role played by sri lanka of course uh, some of its distinguished nationals uh, uh, is too in too significant uh, not to mention here uh, rajini mm-hmm. uh, this contribution was not just in ensuring uh, the application of norms but also in elaborating and interpreting most important legal provisions mm-hmm. so now what is happening is we have taken uh, we have identified sri lanka seems to have identified certain priority areas like you know uh, climate change so at cop 28 uh, sri lanka is initiated and get some processes especially uh, with regard to uh, climate change uh, you know climate justice and mm-hmm. university for climate change etc right and carbon trading uh, all kind of things are actually involved uh, in that particular process right mm-hmm. uh, at the same time and sri lanka in the remaining 7 years or 4 years uh, the 5 6 years that are left out of uh, you know the, the the un development agenda 2030 and uh, trying to find uh, certain areas where uh, it can it can be a kind of an example uh you know but it is a challenging task because you have to catch up with what you lost during uh you know uh, the period beginning 2019 really right mm-hmm. especially up to the build up of the economic crisis so these are challenges uh ca- currently sri lanka is also chairing iora council a number of new initiatives are under consideration there as i understand mm-hmm. and uh, uh in it both in its multilateral and the bilateral format economic diplomacy is a key area and uh, so not just you know uh, you 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 just uh, conduct uh, you know kind of an engagement with other parties or other actors mm-hmm. but also uh, you know it must uh, consist of goal orientation benchmarking outreach capacity uh, like you know and and also a clear economic vision professionalism and leadership so these are things uh, i think uh, you know a uh, lot of thoughts are going on sort of discussions are going on and uh, this is vital uh, for sri lanka's future yes. so basically the country has also simultaneously uh, started uh, engaging with asean regional forum bao mm-hmm. forum shanghai forum and and particularly it, it has reached out to uh you know uh, the countries uh, which are party to the regional comprehensive economic partnership but it may be a long shot but it's still worth mm-hmm. taking right so yes. today external interactions that sri lanka pursues of course are driven by the compelling need to emerge successfully from the multiple challenges uh, that country faces you know this is reality of course yes uh thank you mr aziz i think once again you very comprehensively took us through some of the more nuanced aspects of sri lanka's current foreign policy uh, mm-hmm. and i especially wanted to highlight the fact that even as sri lanka engages uh, more actively in certain forum the capacity yeah. problem that you mentioned but then also mm-hmm. very importantly how even as we observe sri lanka engaging in certain forms of climate diplomacy uh, because right. as we know sri lanka is a small littoral state so it shares many of the same threats that mm. other countries other small island states uh yeah. face as well such as climate mm. change food security and such as you had highlighted so the fact that on the one hand climate diplomacy needs to be wielded but also because many countries around the world are facing certain forms of debt and economic stress that yeah. economic diplomacy also is being simultaneously wielded absolutely uh, so that's a very kind of interesting and developing uh yeah. scenario as we watch it i wanted to ask the final question um which links to this theme yeah um and that is how with the challenges that sri lanka faces but also as we see certain uh, developments at the global level whether it is in term of global conflict or whether yeah. it is in terms of global economic downturn and we have mm. these multiple issues coming up simultaneously mm. the question mm. is how can sri lanka cushion the impact of these more proactively because as you mentioned we also yeah. have elections expected in 2024 so even at the national level we are expecting to see some kind of political activity happening so how do you foresee 
um, these kind of national politics and the global politics intersecting to impact mm. Sri Lanka's foreign policy? Actually, the thing is that, you know, there is a particular concept called intermestic, uh, you know, intermestic uh, uh, principle, right? So it is a kind of an international uh, priority or obligation and uh, domestic compulsion. Sri Lanka has to get the balance right. There is no doubt about it. So I think our our approach to international engagement should be uh, should be really uh, uh, inspired or driven by uh, domestic priorities. But at the same time, we also should understand that the certain international obligations we have taken over uh, should also bear on uh, our own domestic policy. So it's a healthy balance, and then then it of course you know it helps you to preserve your foreign policy space. Uh, while uh, pursuing uh, uh, beneficial uh, projects or proposals with other countries and entities. So it is in that context, I think, uh, you know, we are lacking in, in a way. I think I hope that, you know, that balance uh, uh, at some point, uh, you know, serious, uh, uh, you know, attention, attention would be given to restoring that balance. Uh, once that balance is uh, restored and also in the lead up to, uh, you know, the effort, I think, um, you know, there will be a lot of effects uh, on Sri Lanka's economy and uh, they, and and certain sectors, especially the vulnerable com- communities arising from uh, international and regional development. So we have two issues here. One is a uh, Ukraine-Russia situation, right? And um, of course, you know, that came, uh, you know, at a, at a wrong time for Sri Lanka because uh, uh, the strains of a looming balance of payment crisis was be, were being felt in Sri Lanka very intensely. Mm-hmm. So uh, with an increase in, glo- increase in global oil price and uh, also political and economic chaos in Europe re- reaching other parts of the world, you know, there were, there were preventive efforts. So this particular, uh, you know, uh, thing added to Sri Lanka's uh, then emerging economic crisis. So that point, uh, you know, is, uh, is important to keep in mind. And uh, also European American economic sanctions also impacted some sectors of Sri Lanka's economy, particularly tea industry and tourism industry. And uh, Russia was one of the largest tea markets for Sri Lanka. And um, Russian and Ukrainian tourists usually, usually prefer visiting Sri Lanka and they do in significant numbers and in the past. Uh, so in the context of Russia-Ukraine uh, situation, um, a particular issue that came up was uh, overstaying uh, by tourists uh, from mm-hmm. both countries, particularly Ukraine. And uh, Sri Lanka took a policy decision to allow visa extension, extension. And also some measure of protective and safety measures or safety arrangements were also made. Mm-hmm. So then the, the situation was a concern for foreign policy and diplomacy, no doubt, naturally, right? Mm-hmm. Invariably, uh, it has also since it became uh, an item, uh, it also a concern that uh, uh, that influences, uh, you know, our discourses with uh, uh, external, uh, you know, players. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has since become an item of the agenda for bilateral, multilateral discussion with the U.S. as well as Sri Lanka's European partners. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, Sri Lanka has remained neutral. Uh, taking into account a number of factors, including economic interest and also, and also, uh, you know, the interest of Sri Lanka, the geopolitical interest and also the interest of Sri Lanka uh, in the larger world. Uh, but however, there, is, there was some tendency to be more sensitive to Russia. There is no mm-hmm. doubt about it needs to be recorded. But of course, of course, you know, by and large, when it comes to critical decision making, uh, in the policy making bodies of uh, international community, international organizations, I think uh, Sri Lanka has manifested a kind of a neutral stand. Uh, then, while this was going on, you know, uh, you know, the, the Israeli Palestinian conflict came, and then, of course, that is something that is happening uh, not too far from the region that we are located. So, the first concern mm-hmm. is the likely effect of it. Uh, if it is not resolved, the resolution is the most important thing, but then we also know that it is a uh, long, uh, intractable, apparently intractable issue. Uh, it mm-hmm. has been there for over 30, 75 years. 
Mm-hmm. So if it is not resolved, it should be managed in a way uh, there is no regional spillover. So and 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 uh, the, the problem could of course add to Sri Lanka's economic woes uh, because um, regional instability, especially regional instability, may affect sea lanes and uh, movement of commercial and other vessels on the sea. Uh, with the possibility, or maybe only shudder at the thought, you know, mm-hmm. uh, straits straits of homes, uh, you know, being a possible check chalk point. It's a chalk point, uh, you know. Geopolitically, it's already been uh, identified as a chalk point, but and 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 uh, you know, used as a chalk point, and then and and creating the disruption or diversion uh, is it, it, a situation that we have to avoid. And uh, on top of it, Sri Lanka's migrant labor in the Middle East. You know, mm-hmm. there are, uh, you know, more than half a million people, and the estimates uh, vary. Uh, you know, they are lives, and uh, they are they are lives in those countries, and their livelihoods uh, are all stake there. So, yes. and it will also have a severe impact on the energy security uh, since we depend on fuel uh, from Middle East. So. Basically, to come to the uh, come to the final point of my uh, you know uh, presentation or, or yes. answer on that, Sri Lanka remains among countries, of course, you know, uh, which which are engaged with major players on these issues, and uh, it includes uh, USA, EU, and of course, I I, I guess I hope uh, or India and China uh, in ensuring there is no regional escalation. And at the same time, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and also Egypt and Jordan, which all maintain good relations with Sri Lanka. And uh, we also, I hope, uh, dialogues are going on. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that, you know, uh, all these countries have uh, good, uh, you know, bilateral relations with Sri Lanka. So uh, then uh, multi-level engagements, hopefully, with all countries, uh, you know, that have stakes in the situation should continue and uh, if it have not been started i think mm-hmm. or explored i think should be should be initiated immediately right. thank you mr aziz i think that um, you did a difficult job of trying to kind of summarize some of the very complicated developments that are happening at the global level and some of the constraints and opportunities that sri lanka faces in trying to navigate uh, mm-hmm. these fast evolving situations at the global level, at the regional level, and especially at the national level. Uh, we have yeah. a very interesting year coming forward in 2024 with elections slated. So how that impacts Sri Lanka's foreign relations, hopefully your insights will give our listeners um, some scope to better understand these developments as we watch them unfold next year. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Rajini. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's, it's a good experience for me. And I really value this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So you were listening to former ambassador, Mr. A.L.A. Aziz, former permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in Geneva and Vienna. You are listening to South Asia Chat. To learn more about our work, please visit us at isas.nus.edu.sg. You can also get updates through social media. We are on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you.